welcome back to Access to Perspectives Conversations. Here with me today is Mark Hunnell from Fixture. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for having me, Joe. It's a great pleasure. So Fixture just turned 10 years of age or operations, being an operations on the market and um, of service to the scholarly community. Yeah, let's jump right in. Um, what's your, I don't know, maybe three or five takeaways from the past 10 years? And then moving on, we can take a turn and then look into the future. So how yeah. has it been the past decade of picture? Yeah, so uh, it, it is 10. It, it was 10 in January. And um, it feels like not long at all, but at the same time, a lifetime. Um, and I think a lot has changed in the the concept of Figshare started because I needed a place to make some of my files available to get credit for them when publish, publishers wouldn't accept them because the files were too big. And we're talking about five megabyte video files. So I think, you know, the web has moved on in the way that we'd expect with cloud computing and, and just, you know, a lot more storage and a lot more capacity for viewing different types of academic content on the web. Um, but really, you know, when, when Figshare started, I, I did plan, I, I started it out of my PhD and I did plan that, uh, you know, open data is still a very new concept. Um, let, let's give it a year and if it's going well, you know, I'll continue, but after a year, if it's not going well, I'll just come back to my and do a postdoc. And so a decade later, um, I think the, uh, the field of stem cell biology has moved on so much that I wouldn't it'd be a long time ago that I'd be accepted back into a postdoc. So I suppose on that um, kind of thought piece of is a, where open data is in the global psyche with regards to uh, importance in academia and just this open research ethos in general. I think it's obviously moved on a lot so that things can be sustainable. Um, we were just uh, awarded uh, a grant to work with other generalist repositories like Dryad and Center for Open Science from the NIH. So uh, that's a that's a great point of you know we've gone from will this be able to be a thing that people care about enough for a, for a repository to sustain itself um, to the NIH mandating open data um, in January 2023 for all of the researchers they fund and the associated support that is needed around that. So I know you asked for three. I think that that's one is that, uh, I, you know, it's, it's a good thing that in the last 10 years, things have moved on so much that we're still here. But the I, I in turning 10, I've really been thinking a lot about the last 10 years we're encouraging researchers to put files on the internet and make files openly available that they previously wouldn't. And the next 10 years is really about how can we use them for good? How can we make them more useful so that we achieve um, the, the, the long-term goal of just making academia more equitable, more efficient, you know, and research work in a way that isn't limited by waiting for papers to come out fast but good publishing is a thing I think about a lot these days mm. I just came out of a conversation before this one um, where we touched upon data maintenance especially for repositories we also think about that a, a bit quite a bit I mean not there's no urgency for that as yet with Africa archive because we are still building and, and advocating for encouraging or towards encouraging African scholars to share their work. Um, not that they don't want to, but there's just um, a lot of barriers to work through, <laughs> especially in that part of the world. Um, but now now that we're encouraging for more and more data sharing online, which is certainly good for reproducibility, accountability, and transparency in research, how about data maintenance? How about cleaning up our closets once in a while and ensuring that we don't use storage space and therefore also eventually CO2 emissions um, for no good reasons after all? 
um, like, is there a level that you guys of picture have discovered, like, of quality assurance, as much as also we want to preserve accountability? Like, many repositories, just to put it in this perspective, but we're also struggling with with Epic Archive. There's a level of accountability that's needed. Like, what's online should stay online, like, theoretically for good, but what does for good mean on a human scale or on time measurements? Um, also in, in storage capacity, really, it, like it's easier said than done in a digital age because digital files decay as well. So that's first the technical issues, but then if we accumulate files en masse, can we still make sense of it at a certain point? And then we're calling for artificial intelligence, but there's also already a lot of studies on how reliable, because they also human made, they come with biases. Um, and also there's, uh, like a, a critical amount of carbon emission that comes with a storage, um, which is now in the double digits if you compare it to, yeah, other things that also of course that climate change thing. So I mean, it's it's probably a little bit of opening Pandora's box, but is this something that picture or that you also in these fora um, are discussing, considering, and yeah. 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 So I know, like our, our, our parent organization, Digital Science, has goals around uh, carbon neutrality and things like this. So it is actively a an actively spoke about thing. The the it's it's kind of um, a little bit bipolar in the space in in some of the ideas in that still a lot of my colleagues you know you say you 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 have to make your data sets available you have to make your papers open access and all of these things and you know they'll happily pay twelve thousand dollars to get published in nature if they have the funding available but they'll complain about a thousand dollars for plaza or scientific reports right because that is indoctrined into the system and so when we talk about data i still have close friends who say i'm not making my data available until i'm forced to because um, you know, other people scoop me and all of these things. Um, I'd say in 10 years of open data and 5 million open files on Figshare, we, we see that this isn't the problem that people were thinking it would be. Um, mm. And, you know, you know, you know, in the same way that, that my friend, I've seen people take photos of sunsets on Instagram and then put copyrights on them. And while that may be a concern, I don't think people are going, there's enough openly available photos of sunsets to not go and steal your, <laughs> your proprietary artwork right but yeah. it is built into the system and so i think if we think about it in when i say bipolar it's we want to encourage more people to make more of their content openly available at the same time there is a cost basis to it and there is a uh yeah a climate impact to it and i think you know there's other things on that level that people store as much content on uh, mobile phones and things like this with photographs that they're never going to clean out. But mm -hmm. the, the one thing I think is really interesting when you mention preprints and uh, data is you have um, the traditional publication system, which we're all familiar with. Then you have preprints. And I think the big battle there is fast but good publishing. How do you, you know, make sure that the uh the scandalous newspapers of and journalists of the world don't interpret things in in scrupulous ways as we've seen with covid and then the data space has that problem in that there's no peer review and i don't think there'll ever be peer review of data because it's the data is is this what you're asking is is this data sound has it been well described mm -hmm. is it obviously collected correctly it's not is this novel data right it's it doesn't require three of your peers it just requires somebody who knows what they're talking about to make sure it's well described so it's it's more like an editorial check than it is peer review in my mind mm -hmm. but it still has this problem of wanting of making sure you don't want to have it interpreted wrongly and then you also have the problem that it's not a single unit. So a paper publication in nature is six to 20 pages PDF. A preprint is six to 20 pages PDF. Data sets could be 
you know, I have 10,000 space images or I have, which is three petabytes, or I have one model, which is five megabytes. And, and I only need one DOI for this and I need 3000 DOIs for this. Mm -hmm. And you don't want a limitation to be on reuse. You want to encourage as much as this is another bipolar thing. You want to encourage as much reuse as possible, but then the more reuse there is, the more costs there are, all of these things. It's not so much the storing of data, it's the moving of data that's the problem. So in the future, I think bringing the compute to the files will solve a lot of this problem. But for now, it's how do we encourage people to reuse as much as possible while also being aware that that will involve, you know, 10 million downloads of a file all around the world, right? Yeah, I think it's also a matter of counting all costs that are implied like i have a dog on my lap for those who see the video um and uh so thinking about animal research or research on animals if data was made available i'm sure there would be less need for much of that i'm not i'm not saying there shouldn't be any i mean i wish there were, would be but I, I understand that there's good reasons to have some animal research but that's another discussion to have in an ethics committee or somewhere else or values based happy to have that discussion somewhere at, the, at another um, occasion but but not only um for animal welfare purposes also it's, it's a cause also well-being like how many phd students had to repeat the experiments that have already proven not being um possible to perform or providing or generating the results that you expect thousands of times because the data is not made of being made available or open access results being shared. So so that's a cost like mental well-being of the researchers who have to repeat stupid experiments because um, there's no platform not enough platforms and not enough sharing culture to yeah, to access information that's already available somewhere, um, but also the environmental impacts also like, so yeah, it's like, what, what do we see as a cost versus a benefit of doing the work in the first place? I think that needs to be assessed. And talking about maybe for a minute on um, the work that you also contribute to with the open data report that's coming out annually, and the most recent ones, did you see any developments in how um, over the past three to five years, how data is increasingly being shared through um, the policies and fair data principles that come into play? Is there, I mean, I'm sure there's improvements and I also attended some of your presentations of that report. Um, so there's some success stories to share there, right? And still also more work to be done. But yeah, just share some of that. Yeah. So that, that's a really, the way you phrase that is a really interesting angle as well, because I'm quite the optimist. So I tend to, you know, focus on the positives. And it's always crazy looking back at 10 years and thinking, wow, that's amazing. Look how far, you know, as I said, 5 million files that weren't publicly openly available are now openly available. Anyone can publish anything, you know, and back in the, when we started, there wasn't a place where you could publish stuff like that for free, which is why we started. Mm -hmm. Now you do have things like Zenodo and you do have preprint servers. And, and this is a newer thing. There was archive for physics, but that, that's about it. And if I think about what has happened and, and what the potential for moving the space on and making academia more efficient, I think I see it as the example I've used in one of those talks is the deep mind making use of uh, protein data bank and, and having the protein folding problem that was a costly 50 year endeavor just solved overnight. They went from 30% of all human protein structures accurately predicted to 99. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a shift change in that field that you know, couldn't have happened without open data well described and, and how do we do that for all data? So that's why I, I focus as an optimist. But, and this is a big but, I remember in the early days of Figshare being invited to talk at a conference specifically on how open data can help reduce the amount of animals in uh, research. 
for the reasons you explained, people doing the same experiment over and over again. Um, and I would say that that is something that hasn't, um, it's moved along at some level, but it hasn't moved in that if you find a paper and see someone's done an experiment, you can get the data behind it. But there's a lot of the, the idea of negative research being made openly available is not happening. The largest driver for people making data openly available is that they have something they want to share with the world in that they've got some really cool file formats and it doesn't translate it in a publication well, or they are being told to as a part of their funding or as a part of their uh, or they're publishing a paper and they say you need to make the data available. Mm -hmm. And so the vast majority of if anyone can just make any of their data openly available, will they make all this negative data openly available on, you know, I tried this, I had a good idea, I tried this, and it, it, it turned out my hypothesis wasn't correct, but here's the data anyway. The incentive structure is not there for busy researchers to make their data available on that level. And so there's still a lot of wastage there that, I mean, even the NIH's policy, which is, we've had a lot of different funder policies over the years from, you know, South Africa, China, um, but uh, Western Europe, but and so the the one I'm focusing on on the NIH being next year is a big, big, the largest medical research funder on the planet. It's still if we fund you at the point of your publication, make your data available. That's mm -hmm. the mandate. Mm -hmm. So that's not publish every, the result of every experiment you've done. And it, it might be that they. Are nudgy, they can't just jump straight in and they'll drink people towards this. But yeah, uh, maybe if if I don't just focus on the positives, I see there's uh, lots of work that can be done with reducing, if it, uh, improving efficiencies when it comes to things that are important like animal research. Yeah, on that note, well, maybe uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel, which is like a decade old and long. Um, there is a Mm -hmm. from from one german institute they've they've developed a database where any researcher from around the world can register animal research experiments before they get started to have them assessed for rigorosity and well planning to reduce the number or re reduce replace with fine like the three r principle in animal research that's hopefully becoming more um more, better known um so so there is like at least this and the, i think in the uk there's also a registry of a similar sort yeah but i agree like the initiatives and and services on, on that angle are still scarce so there's quite a bit of more work to be done um i think there's a good point there around broad strokes like broad strokes or narrow focus and i think for problems with a mm -hmm. specific use case like that the idea of it might be, you know, a high tide lifts all ships. So if there's everyone making more data available, there is going to be more efficiency or, or making their papers openly available so everyone can read them. There is going to be more efficiency. But at the same time, you need, uh, you know, it's like the moonshot missions, right? It, they wanted to land on the moon and they made it happen, right? If you want to reduce animal uh, research, inefficiencies then you come up with a solution like that and i think this is also where we'll see more work you know joe biden has the cancer moonshot in america which revolves around open open data around cancer right with a mission and i think you know sustainable development goals climate change i think if you apply each of those contexts to open research and open data then you stand that's how we'll focus in some of these you know return on investments basically for making data openly available over the years yeah so that's also a question we had in the, like where in one of your presentations like do you believe that open science and open data can save the world looking at the pandemic looking at what we're now dealing with in, in the ukraine and russia and looking at climate change do you believe that we as researchers can can foster open data and fair data in a way that also allows other societal stakeholders to work with us, scholars, to change for the better, <laughs> to finally, you know, make make a uh, 
yeah, to, to, to do better than we've done in the past. Yeah, and I mean, it's, 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 it's been an awful way to find out some of these things, right? So COVID is just, obviously it's had tragic consequences for a lot of people, but as a, as a humanity experiment, it's proven some things that, you know, people may have questioned before. And so on the negative, it's, you know, people will believe stuff that they want to believe in minorities, right? So there are a small subset of people will just, you know, you can show them that this, this ball is red and they will believe whatever they want to believe that fits their agenda, right? But for the vast majority of people, they do care about getting the evidence and understanding what's happening. And I think, you know, we've seen this in the past with open access to papers where people get ill or their family members get ill and they want to read up on it and can't access any of the content, right? And they haven't heard of Sci-Hub because they're not in academia, right? So there's, there's, there's problems um, that we see on that level. And then you can see, you know, the, the, just the sheer amount of literacy around understanding and interpreting data from COVID has, has been that everybody understands now that this should be the norm. If you have a statement, you need to back it up, particularly around healthcare concerns. You need to back it up with the data, right? You don't have, um, you didn't have Donald Trump saying, I won the election. And when people are saying, well, can we see the results of the, you know, the counts in being saying, no, you don't need to see it. I, 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 I won the election, but that's what we have in academia, right? We have people mm. publishing papers and data available upon request, and it's never been made, it will never be made available, right? But I've often thought about asking for retractions of those papers, but I think I'd be hunted in the street if I suddenly caused the retraction of a bunch of papers. So mm. it's, it's, it's a balance, really. Um, one of my favorite topics is global research equity. Uh, well, um, I'm using that term um, in the sense also from where we're coming from with Africa Archive to create a global scholarly community, which some of it argue we already have, but I don't see that happening as much. Um, and not blaming English only as presumably being the lingua franca, if we look at um, research um, or scholarship and text, there's and that being counted, English is probably predominant in the databases that we in the Western Hemisphere are all familiar with. But then um, there's also quite a large body being published in Russian, in Mandarin, in Portuguese. There's a huge scholarly community in, in Brazil and Portugal <laughs> and some um, African countries as well. Um, so yeah. Uh, and picture is widely adopted around the world so how do you see global research equity come into play through the work that you do with your team and how do you see it being adopted in not the usual suspect countries of this world yeah so i think there is huge opportunity but there's also limitations and i think if we're looking at the types of content that we're talking about if you know figshare came out as a, a a data research files associated with a research paper kind of uh space and and we now deal in paper repositories thesis repositories preprints and all of those things but from a pure data point of view from this new era of data publishing i think what's great is that you know we we were i thought we we're i we're not lo we're no longer a startup i feel after 10 years you can't really call yourself Aww, a startup but, is that uh, much? Yeah, but, the, but the um the but the way we came into the world working with digital science it was very much working with other startups in the space and a lot of people had this idea you know if academic publishing was invented today this is what it would look like mm. and it's it's true but academic publishing wasn't invented today. So a lot of your assumptions are therefore invalid in the tools that you're making if you're saying, well, if academic publishing was invented today, everyone would just, it'd just be like, everybody has a lab wiki and they just put their information on there. It's like, true, but it's not gonna work because people wanna get published in high impact factor journals. There's a lot of work 
in that space from Dora and those folks and the other folks trying to reduce that down. And I think universities have a role to play, funders have a role to play with that. But to try and shift that mindset is going to happen, you know, one funeral at a time, as they as they used to say. And the it's it's hard to move past. But whereas in the data space, you don't have that. So you have research organizations not reliant on necessarily on publishers and taking back their own control over it, funders, governments that taking control over their own data. So that's great for equitability where the equitability may fall down is there's a great term fair data findable accessible interoperable and reusable data and you can do a bit of that using machines right so our the repositories we provide are fair supported so you know if you have fair data and put it in a fig share repository it will it will be fair but we can tick all of the technical boxes, but you need the human element of it when you say, you know, findable. Findable is great if you give it a great detailed title and you can nudge people and say, data set is not a great <laughs> title, maybe change the title, but yeah. people ignore it, right? Yeah. Whereas if you have um, the education level and the curation level and the librarianship level, which isn't equitable around the world and it isn't equitable within each uh, country because you'll always have the, the big well-funded organizations that can provide more support and the lower less funded uh, organizations that have lower support and therefore their researchers might not be describing their content well, therefore it doesn't get found as much therefore it doesn't get reused as much and if reuse is the metric to drive your career then you're going to have this rich get richer poor get poorer kind of mentality mm -hmm. so i think that is one thing that the funders internationally and um within each country should be looking at is how do we make sure that for new methods of research communication there is equitability in support yeah, I agree. As a as a trained biologist, I'm also coming from a research environment that was, or a person who was looking into evolution, I know how to appreciate diversity, not only in natural ecosystems, but also in technical ecosystems. And that's also what we try and foster with Africa Archive. And now, um, like we with Africa Archive, we, we've had you know discussions um around or also comparisons so for profit non-profit um not only that but also uh like the digital infrastructure is ha has been developed in silos for good reasons so nothing wrong with that there's always a starting point and it's very much specific and then now we live in an era where all our service providers are trying to connect the dots and that's also what we what you mentioned earlier that you now work on on that uh, what is it like the, the the project that you mentioned earlier you received the grant oh, with the nih with the it's called the green project and it's the generalist repository improvement mm. yeah so how do you see or how do you position the fixture in the ecosystem of uh soon to be or or in the process of being developed global scholarly infrastructure and do you see like what are the benefits in having a diverse system or a system that's created and, and composed of diverse entities like i said like for profit but also a non-profit and anything in between we also i also had a paper um, together with my friend and colleague, we were really looking into, into these things. Also, how are each of these repositories and services funded? Is it a single funding source? How, like, is it, or is it mixed funding? And where is the com funding coming from on the national, national or regional level? So these are all details that can be quite confusing and are also complex and diverse in their nature on various levels. And I think that's that's a good thing. So, well, here's my opinion. What's yours? 
<laughs> yeah, um, I, I think it's a good thing. I think, you know, it, it takes, I think it's, it's you know, a well-established fact now that a diversity of opinions on things can help, you know, and uh, collaboration across the world is also a good thing for improving outcomes, um, projected outcomes. I think um, the the strengths and there's weaknesses of everything, right? And one thing I've, uh, one thing, so when Figshare started, we, we spoke to a couple of different folks and, and being a, a, then getting startup investment, we became, you know, a commercial entity and, and the core focus immediately was sustainability, right? And so now as things stand today, we have hundreds of paying clients and you might say well okay some of them might cancel next year but the chances of all hundred of you know hundreds of them canceling means that we're quite secure and we can model out how we can grow and how we can hire more people in different places to do different things um and you know we are a, a global team now and we have people in we have employees in africa we have employees in america we have employees in australia um continental europe as well and so it is useful to have that uh and we can see that during covid we see even more that collaboration can happen it's sometimes frustrating i still come to the office myself even though no, not many other people do but um i think if you're thinking about where the balance is i think the thing i always tell people when they're working with figshare is don't trust me I could be dead tomorrow. Trust the contracts that you're signing. Make sure the contracts you're signing adhere to everything that you're hoping they adhere to. Make sure you're avoiding lock-in, which is a traditionally uh, difficult thing in the academic space. The, the flip side to this is if we hadn't have gone that route, we'd have got a grant and we'd have spent all the money and it would be nice and it'd be in an open source repo somewhere, like a thousand other repository systems, right? And so forcing sustainability is a big thing and i i see a lot of organizations i'm on the data side board i'm on, on the advisory committee for doaj and see a lot of you know institutional membership fatigue if you're just paying oh you pay ten thousand dollars for this reason it's it's difficult because people are like well there's a hundred people asking so why if you start having to prioritize orchid over this one then it gets difficult the question uh, so sustainability is easier if it's just upfront and um uh it, it's it's transparent i always say the aim is to put in more value than you take out um i think there's a lot of economies of scale but i'm also happy that the space we work in has a diversity of tooling because the thing you'd want to avoid, speaking as the CEO of Figshare, the thing we'd want to avoid is Figshare becoming a monopoly in this space, right? Because then you're inviting in potential for bad behavior or you're inviting in pro, uh, systems like that. So I'm delighted that there's been this Cambrian explosion of other systems that you can use like Zenoda or Dryad or, um, well, some of, the, some of the commercial ones, maybe not so much, but, um, it's it's a, always a difficult balance. And I think the one that on the not-for-profit side of things, the learning that should be there is to focus on sustainability in the same way as if you were gonna run out of investment for your startup. And then in in vice versa, learning from you know data site and folks like that, it's what is your objective here? What are you setting out to solve the problem of? And are your goals aligned with setting it, with solving that problem? And I think if you can match the two, then both sides can learn from each other. Yeah, that's also what I yeah, believe in and, and have seen functioning. So totally in line with that. And what I also often encounter, and I think I was trapped in that myself, if I'm honest to myself, um, is that for some time i thought oh we do this for a greater good and i'm investing I, I do this voluntarily or for no um payment not realizing that i'm doing this from a, a prestigious or luxury position like having maybe salary or other securities 
to be able to have that ease of mind to do the work free of charge, but somebody is still paying. And I feel that many nonprofits have a similar mindset and then assume, well, not generally speaking, but it's probably towards what you just said, like focus on sustainability. Also, we're creating valuable services and we employ people who need to get their food on the table, <laughs> including myself and us. Like, I mean, there's only so much you can do. We all have to eat at the end of the day, no matter where in the world we live. And for that, yeah, it comes down to a very entrepreneurial or for-profit if you want um, approach, services need to get paid for. The question is who's paying? Should it be the researcher? Should it be, again, the public through taxes? Um, now that we create services that are internationally applicable or usable, should it be a nation to, or an institute in one city? Um, um, or one department in an institute in one, one country pay for all of that. And these questions are being asked on like everywhere you look. And there's there's also diversity of solutions to that or evolutions that occur. <laughs> and like Zenodo that was mentioned, like that we both mentioned, where I mean is CERN Institute has made a decision, I don't know how long ago, about a decade as well, I think, or a little bit more, that yeah, we're gonna finance the nodal forever <laughs> and i just had a, like you know seems very generous but how much longer can i really do that now that's being more and more um, adopted um but yeah again but we also see a diversity of services that are similar and yet different so we can keep learning from each other so just pointing this out and um i think the beauty with as uh, and also um, like all of us talking to each other and reflecting on these things allows us also to create these best practices that are needed to provide good services in the long run. Yeah, it, it has been just just like speaking frankly, one of the one of the things I've found tough over the last 10 years is that, you know, there's a lot of moral signaling and, and good versus evil and, and commercial it in some people's eyes falls into the evil point of view and you know it, it's difficult because I, I i felt that i wasn't able to uh i'm not able to speak my mind on on public matters on things and so you know um because it because of the polit political situation surrounding it and things like that so if anything it's just forced me to i know i'm talking publicly now but retract away and I do a lot less, you know, uh, hypothesizing on these things now because, you know, there's, there's no benefit. You think you're doing something for the greater good and you can be committed to that. But if, if you're constantly getting stones thrown at you, it's, it's demoralizing. So you just have to focus on understanding what your plans are and what I was saying about what you learned from the uh not-for-profit communities and what are we trying to achieve and what is the north star and and we have you know the fig share uh core principles listed out on our website that you can go and see and you know we we, we just stick to that and get on with it and it it's 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 nice to have forced collaboration at a time when sometimes it might start not happening naturally right Hmm. I think also what I realized at some point um, is that entrepreneurship or maybe commercialism, I don't know if commercialism really, but looking at entrepreneurship and also running a company in the old days, whenever that was, like I, I think the, the breaking point was the Second World War and the time since then when it was all about growth, no matter the cost, that like we have to make more revenue. Why? Well, we don't know why, because some people in this company want to get richer and because mm -hmm. we're being measured according to growth. Instead of before, uh, from what I've seen also in Germany or in many European countries, and I mean, for sure also elsewhere, companies would treat their staff like family. And they were filling gaps that now NGOs fill in society to provide services for the betterment of society to make life easier for I don't know, producing a washing powder that would take away some of the work from you know, women in the in society and to allow them more 
quality of life because now you have a washing machine. And but I don't know, I think we're also in an era with all these crises going around to come back to the senses that, as again, speaking as a biologist, uh, limitless growth is, is cancer at the end of the day. And we see that in capitalism, <laughs> like it's not working. Nature, like this world is not made for, for limitless growth. And there's no, there's no point in the long run. And there's too many people who suffer along the way. Well, I think a lot of people have realized that in, in COVID times, right, with the amount of people changing jobs or just deciding they don't want to or don't need to work. But again, that's a luxury that like you were talking about before. And I think one of the things, this is a slight tangent, but one of the things I, I think about is, as I say, I come to the office because I like people and I like coming to the office. And just, I'm in a hundred person office with six people today, right? Um, and I'm in London and COVID is over. But um, that's not true globally, right? There's, there's, so I'm thinking now about how do we encourage people? Obviously, people can work from home and that's no problem. But if, you know, if we can have, if you're an early career, uh, you're early in your career, you would benefit, in my opinion, from coming to an office and meeting people and evolving that way. And I think a lot of people will lose stuff from being on just on Zoom meetings because um that's what that's the path of least resistance right i don't have to get on a tube and all of this stuff but that again that's a place of luxury because um there's a lot of people who won't be able to go back to the office for years because of covid right because of the global disparities between vaccination and things like this so it's it's you know i saw that uh i think one of the countries is not giving vaccines to one of the other countries because of the uh, the uh, Ukrainian invasion and and all of these things and and it's you know I understand it but at the same time it's can we I think we need to try and if we're trying to move towards a global narrative of everybody should be able to achieve anything in academia there's going to be there's going to be curveballs but I don't think uh, I don't think it's going to be easy over the next five years just to get on a common footprint with working environments. Hmm. Yeah, can we maybe, I mean, we can get as political as we want to, and we can also cut it very short. But now, I, I, I've also posted about the situation that there was, at the onset of the war, there was thousands of Russian scientists speaking out against invasion for peace and, like, clearly... You know, blaming some, okay, that's not too political, but so there is the opposition, which now we see also in the news is being oppressed actively, I and mean, it has been also in the past years and decades, but now increasingly so. Um, so do you believe that open data, open science practices can create a level of academic freedom that can decouple from politics? Can we keep working with these researchers who want to continue doing research and also whether about the political circumstances in their countries, but how can they do that if we now ban everyone from collaborating? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's a, there's probably no right answer to this, but except for like, what do we currently, the situation, what we know today, believe? Is there, is there possible? Is there such a thing as academic freedom during war times? Well, I mean, just, just as an example of this, one thing that's upset me in the past about Sci-Hub is when they cut off access to Russia, right? Because Russian professors insulted Alexander Elkivan. I'm like, well, that's kind of counterintuitive to what sci -Hub's supposed to be, isn't it? It's supposed to be that anyone can access any content anywhere. 100% illegal for lawyers who are listening, but it was. I found it to be a smack in the face when that happened. That said, I think I think as long as web infrastructure can persist, then across uh, geographies, then things can ha you know things can continue to work and people can continue to build on top of the research that's gone before. I think you know I remember being at uh, Tomsk University in Central Russia and seeing their libraries there, hundreds of years old, which are just you know it's the edge of Siberia, but they're their, their libraries are on a par with University of Oxford and other long-term mm. 
long-standing academic institutions that have been around for hundreds of years and gone through hundreds of wars right so it the difference between then and now is that you have a way to communicate and as long as those levels of communication can happen then you know access to content and access to information then it's no problem and i think this is something we saw with covid when uh, in the state of open data survey that we did annually is the amount of people who are reusing other people's data or their own data in a way that they hadn't done in the past out of necessity actually was really good for the space in terms of you know efficiencies and if you can't be in the wet lab just pushing 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 with this moving forward capitalist mentality in that you move forward and don't look back to see well actually is the more information that i could get out of the work i've done it's only when you're forced to do that that you can find yeah i could write a few more papers about my findings here or i could thoroughly finish off this project before moving on to the next bigger and better thing and um so i think that could happen with academia no problem as long as people have access to collaboration can continue mm -hmm. as long as people have access to the web yeah and that's again like why we are working towards a globally inclusive technical and digital infrastructure um Maybe like uh, an interest of time and coming towards uh, some conclusive remarks. Um, let's 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 draw a utopia of of scholarship. Where do you? What was your best case scenario? I mean, I think it was obvious. Like everybody would have equitable access to research communication, also be able to contribute to it. Um, so maybe that's that was too easy. <laughs> what are the next tangible steps we can and should take as researchers, as research service providers, and as a community of scholars? Well, yeah, I think there's there's a tendency to think that tasks are insurmountable because they're too big and culture is too big to change. It, but you know, it's in the same way that open access you know, started in the 80s, but it was only last year that we went past 50% of publications being made open access, um, which is great, though, because it means that more than 50, the majority is now open access, right? So it took a while, but we got there. And I think that's true. As I say, looking back on the last 10 years and looking forward to the next 10 years, I think um, the things that need to be worked on are the training and education around ways to disseminate scholarly information the um the funding of infrastructure whether it's grant based or university based or anything else uh needs to come from all so it needs to continue from all fronts in the same way that the training needs to come from all the fronts the publishers have a a, a, a requirement there or the publishers have a a reason that they had they should be doing that and they are doing that and you see that from plaws and springer nature they've both done a lot and uh, taylor and francis they've both they've all done a lot around data and uh pushing the needle on what traditional publishing is and i think you know it's easy to attack the publishers because they're often seen as the cash cows but at the same time there are people within those publishers who are doing good um but um i I mean, one of my concerns around that still is that I just mentioned open access went over 50%. But if you compare gold open access versus green open access, it's, it's uh, you know, hockey stick in gold open access and green open access is linear, mm -hmm. right, in terms of growth. And so I think there really needs to be a, a conscious push towards better green open access. And this is where I'm excited working in the repository space is because we can help that. Repositories have failed to that level, right? If, if, uh, and this is somebody who is in the repository space and builds repositories, right? We, I'm, I'm saying we have failed at that so far mm -hmm. in that we've let gold open access become the easy mode. And, you know, we, we have, I, I, I'm not a, a grant funded researcher. So if I want to publish a paper, what are my options? And I'm, as I say, from a, you know, in a, in a good place and I have a job, but how do you make that equitable for everybody? And I think there is, so the continued push on open access publication, particularly gold, uh, green open access publication, publications, I think 
spinning around open data and um, description of you know this idea of you will get better rewards if you make your data easy to find which is a hard one um, so that needs to go on globally and then I think we'll get to some consensus on this kind of preprints fast but good publishing right I think with fast and good if you pull on one the other one moves too you know if the faster it is the harder it is to check it's good mm. the longer it is and but I think the fact that preprints have taken off so much just shows the 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 desire to improve the traditional model which may have some bits of good but is a long way from fast and so I think focusing on fast but good focusing on training around um new realms of publishing and pushing for green open access and you know 10 years from now we'll all be building on top of the work that's gone before us and no animals will be getting harmed and we'll be still mining that great big data base in the sky mm. yeah oh that looks like a world i want to live in thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay let's keep working towards that thank you so much for for being here for the conversation we had and speak to you soon